James Brown, soul brother number one, Mr. Dynamite, the godfather of soul, the minister of super heavy funk, has always been fanatical about his appearance. There was a time when his retinue of dressers, valets, makeup artists, managers and bodyguards was numbered in dozens. His elaborate hairstyle, I had so many waves in my hair people would get seasick, has always played an important part in the presentation of his carefully groomed image to the general public. Brown's retinue is more modest now, but his 500 tailored stage costumes and 2,000 pairs of shoes have been carefully preserved. You know, I've saved all my stuff, all my uniforms, all my shoes, everything that had to do with James Brown on the stage, even my speeches. I'm gonna make a James Brown museum because I want people to know and the young kids that feel they got a chance to make it. And the only way they feel they got a chance to make it is that they have somebody around to look at. Unfortunately for the black kids, they have nobody. White kids can look at uh, George Washington, they can look at Abraham Lincoln, they can look at the Johnsons, the Kennedys, they can look at everybody. And when I come up, I had Superman. And Hoblong Cassidy, and they were white people. Not that I've got, I, I, I got anything against the color, but the black kid has to see things out of his own eyes and see things that resembles him. Like God made man his own creation, uh, in his own image. So man feel he can, he can, can make it. Augustus, 521 from WRDW Radio, The Soul Connection. The love mask is on the case. Your soul hook up until 10 a.m. this morning. Weatherman says it's going to be another hot one today with a high in the mid-90s, low tonight near 70. Right now on the outside, we've got partly cloudy skies, 74 degrees. It's time to get up and get it on. Come on. Party time with your master of love. Looks like it's going to be all right. I've got that feeling, yeah. Get up off of that thing. Come on.
finished product in concert or on a record sleeve shows Brown as he wishes the world to see him. The image grooming masks the man. But what about the musician? How does he get his ideas? How does he set about making his records? In the studio or in the pool room, Brown no longer has to perform and the mask drops a little. Technical sophistication is foreign to him. From the earliest days, it became apparent that the feeling mattered more than the quality of the sound. Yeah. That real uh, dry, funky sound he had on uh, uh, summertime and uh, have a happy day. That slap, you know, the way he was doing it. Because uh, he, he plays that way, but uh, he plays that way, but it's not coming out the earphone. Cause I, I still, yeah. I'm not getting that funk sound on them drums. They're playing it, but it's not coming out. You know? Yeah, it's just made a change in the Yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not happening. First, I get uh, something that, that sticks with me. It makes me know that, that this is happening. Then I relate it to people, the movement of people, the same rhythm of people talking and moving, and wh which way they're going. And uh, then I take that and, and, and make a whole production out of it. It's the funny thing about my recording. I can take my band, I can take a band, and put it together and get James Brown sound. And even if a band has been me 10 years, they can't do it themselves. And I can do it in 30 or 40 minutes with a new band. Anybody that can play and know the instrument well enough to keep reproducing what I tell them. Because I'm real forceful. I keep on driving. I hate to say this, but you just ain't funky until you've worn a James Brown Future Shop t-shirt. 
It has the picture of the number one soul brother on front, and it's cool. Pick up one today for just four dollars at Jack Levine's, 1825 North Monroe Street, Augusta. in this shack some 20 miles north of Augusta, Georgia, James Brown struggled through 20 years of poverty-stricken family life. Eyewitness accounts of that time say Brown was a small and rather unattractive child with an aggressive need to prove himself. No, 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 no. Survival was the first lesson to learn, begging, dancing, shoe shining. Even finding the fuel to keep warm during the winter months was a problem. When I was a kid, I was, it was real bad. We had the big heaters in the middle of the floor. And we didn't have coal, so we'd pick up coke, which is coal burnt in its first stages. Coal burns a couple of times. It becomes coke, then it becomes clinkers. That's when it diminished and crumbled up. But we would get it when it was coke. And that means it has a chance to burn again. And uh, that's the only way we had to get stay warm. And I had to pick it up every day off the railroad tracks. And I used to sing a lot when I was picking up coke. I'd make up songs. Those were the rough days for me. Um, I really didn't tap dance. Uh, well, I always say I tap dance, but uh, really what we do is buck dance, heel and toe. Tap dance is all toes. Uh, I tap dance, I buck dance for the cavalry. Our rent was $5 a month. And I had to buck dance for the soldiers. And uh, they would throw quarters and nickels to see me dance. And I'd pick it up, I'd get 5 or $10, and take it back home and give it to my great aunt. And they would pay the rent. I 
shine shoes. I pick up Coke bottles. Uh, I sold bottle caps. Uh, I used to work on the farm. I used to sell ice, deliver ice. I used to rake yards, uh, rake leaves, run errands. And the bad thing about it, when I was a kid, about seven years old, we would go out and hustle uh, men for the women was, that were practicing prostitution. At the age of 17, in 1950, James Brown earned first prize in a singing competition at Augusta's now dilapidated Lenox Theatre. In 1952, he surfaced in Macon, Georgia, with a small group called the Famous Flames. Their first big success together, recorded and released by King Records in 1956, was the gospel-orientated number, Please, Please, Please. His one and only promotional photograph of that time described the adolescent Brown as the rugged young man from the country seeking credibility and a better hairstyle. I wrote it, and it was, it was a song that, um, that we sang for five years, maybe a little bit more before we, we recorded it. The minute the song came out, it was a smash. Uh, my song has that presence. If my songs are going to make it, they'll make it right then. They don't grow on people. They start. I can tell when I got a smash hit. Do you think of Please, Please, Please as being the breakthrough, the song that made you? The song that made me was Please, Please, Please. And then after that became songs like Try Me that were very strong. The song that broke through to everybody was Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. But then they went back and picked up Please, Please. It's still the strongest tune. <laughs> The success of this song, the first of a long series, ensured that Brown's grainy gospel voice would become a fixture on radio stations throughout the southern states, injecting some of the hysteria of revivalist singing into the critical development of rhythm and blues. For over 20 years now, the cape theatrics of Please, Please, Please have been the trademarks of a James Brown show. We tried to get away from it a lot because we thought it was repetitious. But Feeling is never repetitious. Soul is never repetitious. What is soul? For me, it's my life. It was my opportunity. It was my knock on the door. It was my only guarantee I had. And it's still my only guarantee. Soul is spiritual. Soul is true. Soul is realism. Soul as survivor.
Give them a big round of applause, the JBs. I mean, understand the system, not understand the things it take. I try to get a Mars with you. I don't have whiskey bottles and things all in my dressing room, like a lot of entertainers. I don't have a lot of drugs around my stable. I try to dress everybody by their last name. I use the words Mister. And uh, all that would project even on the stage. They knew that I was trying to come from a different type of thing. My act was so revolutionary that I made the Ed Sullivan show. And they couldn't believe it. I got so many applause in the dress rehearsal until they didn't know whether to keep the dress rehearsal or, or, or film it again. I was sure of myself. 
I knew what I had. And I wouldn't compromise on nothing but making it just like I wanted. I had been convinced that what people wanted, and I wouldn't compromise. From 1963, the record album of the James Brown show, Live at the Apollo, stayed in Billboard's top 100 for 66 weeks, even reaching number two, an unprecedented success for hardcore rhythm and blues. Brown had built up a regular road band, an increasingly tight performance, and in fact, an entire review with members of the troupe doubling as opening acts. They traveled constantly throughout America, playing to ever larger and more ecstatic all-black audiences. Brown Review was the toughest, the loudest, the most together. Also the most disciplined, since fluffed notes or poor appearance by any musician were penalized by $50 fines. And in front of it all, the hardest working man in show business, James Brown, singer and dancer extraordinary. Always the most acrobatic, always the most controlled, and if he's to be believed himself, the inventor of all the latest discotheque steps. You know, most of the dance that they were taking from James Brown. One way or another, every step you see is James Brown. Boogaloo is probably one of the hardest dancers in the world. I used to get dizzy doing it. And I go right straight through the dances and give you a variation. It'll blow your mind. And when your thing is all messed up. I used to do a little tap dancing too. So the Boogaloo. Fuck a chicken. The old James Brown. Mashed potatoes. And uh, camel walk. I did this in the Tammy show. Also, uh, robot. Soul train. Uh. Super Soul Sound of Fleetwood Mac from WRDW, your soul connection. Love Master with a hookup until about 10 o'clock this morning. We're 12 away from 6 right now. Time to rise and shine with the Super Radio Station, WRDW. WRDW, Augusta, good for your body, your mind, and your soul. However spectacular his review, however dominating his performances, Brown's fortune, like any modern musician's, was and still is founded on his record sales. Tours and the disc jockeys provide the essential promotion for the records, and Brown makes a lot of records, over 60 albums and more than 120 singles. From 1963, the formula for James Brown's success shifted from vocal harmony to driving rhythm. Simple, repetitive vocals were laid over compulsive rhythmic riffs, and Brown and his band began to treat every instrument as if it were a drum. The beat of Brown's brand new bag 
was the wave of the future to be echoed in black music all over the world. I'm not playing on the dance. No, I'm not playing the dance, Rick. I'm not playing the dance. I am not playing the dance of, of, de of December, no place. Brown is no. one of the very few entertainers who personally controls well, his own fortune. His near tyrannical approach to no, his business I, I, affairs has shown that a black entertainer's future need never be confined to singing and dancing for the white market. In 1969, the year the United States National Business League named him Businessman of the Year. He was quoted as earning $8 a minute. There's no check positive. He owns a fleet of 30 cars, a private jet, real estate, and radio stations. Cash your money order. All cashier checks. Cash your money order, cashier checks. Such public acquisition of wealth in the United States has brought Brown inevitably into contact with politics. It was in the late 60s that he encouraged black enterprises, entertained troops in Vietnam, 
dined with LBJ at the White House, urged the ghetto youths to distrust violence, and campaigned for Hubert Humphrey. And that's 45,000. Okay? We'd like to know sometime what's going to be done for black people. So I'm going to start now by making a few overtures to the gentleman standing on my right, and I'm going to see how you respond to him. First, I'd like to say, the black man want ownership. He want to be able to own his own things and, and make up his own mind. Number one in the black community, the low-income areas, we need houses. So we don't have to stay in the dump, like I stayed in when I was a kid. Number two, we need hospitals. So we don't have to stand around and bleed to death while some other cat get work done. I mean, this is the way it is. I, I believe in telling like it is. I don't know no pretty words. I'm going to tell you just like I feel. No, number three, we need our own bank so we can get some money to do things for ourselves. We don't want nobody to do it for us. We want to do it for ourselves. We want the bank to be available in the, in the black community. We don't want to go downtown. We want to do it out here. Number three, we need hotels so when our friends come to see us, we can take a business in the black community and not go downtown and stay in the white community. We want to have the things where we can enjoy. Now, the president, now the candidate that, that give me those kind of things, that's the man I endorse. I don't endorse the party, I endorse the man. James Brown also supported Dr. Martin Luther King's Poor People's Campaign. His network televised speech made after Dr. King's assassination was said to have been directly responsible for preventing street rioting. And it was at this time that Brown was referred to as the soul singer who could stop an American revolution. Martin Luther King's last speech, the mountain speech, was made the day before he died. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I got a call from Washington, D.C. after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I, they wanted me to come and talk to the people and try to get them to get off the streets and calm down so they could think very clear. I wanted to see people get off the streets. I wanted them to calm down. I didn't want to see no more bloodshed and lives lost. But yet still I shared in the same conviction as the people on the streets because I understood what they were fighting for and what they're still fighting for. It's not as much in the street today as, as it is in the courtrooms, but it's still there. Black power one day will be people power. But until a black man come into his own, there's still a struggle. But music is Brown's politics. And now he considers himself a world entertainer. Mexico, his nearest foreign country, is one of his favorite territories. The sound effects can be electric when he plays in the stone-built bull rings. In Mexico, as in Africa, 
He matches his undoubted popularity with his appeal to a race of people who at one time were the victims of slavery. Mexico! whose features have a curious Aztec quality, was born under the astrological sign of Taurus. On his index finger, he brandishes a massive silver ring, portraying a bull's head and horns.
How do you see yourself in relationship to, to Africa and the African people? Well, I see myself as somewhat of a hero from coming from the ground to where I'm at today. And I believe that I can be a model man for my brothers and sisters of Africa. And I think I can be a model man for any poor man because I think I'm a symbol of what he would like to be, a success. The last time I was in Africa, I saw people getting closer to reality, becoming more aware, becoming more educated. And I hope with this education that uh, my race of people I hope we don't lose our primitive thoughts, our roots. Africa, too, is Brown's world. He was one of the earliest popular black entertainers to make the pilgrimage to West Africa, the return to his roots. The commercial benefits of building bridges to Africa are obvious. But even in Senegal, a French-speaking country, and Brown speaks no French, he has a certainty that he is coming home. And on the obligatory visit to Gori Island, point of embarkation for thousands of America-bound slaves, Brown sees how connections can be made. Soul has become a very public code, understood by black people on both sides of the Atlantic. And James Brown is the code breaker. He brings from America what he and his brothers have made of their African heritage. And he calls it Senegal Soul. between the different time, between the British and French, until the French, they took this island from 1818 to 1960. But many forts were built here by the Dutch, which have been many times. You have this round house over there, behind you. It was a Dutch fort, now that's a jail. We have something like 100 prisoners, uh, very small prisoners making maybe this feeling. Uh, they are living in the there are some ladies from the island of Gore, Mrs. Bass and Mrs. Guy. They are living on the island. And they wish you welcome to the island. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Les Portugais furent les découvreurs de Gorée en 1444. The Portuguese discovered this island in 1444. Ils n'ont quitté l'île qu'en 1580. They just left in 1580. Et durant l'époque portugaise, Gorée était ceinturée d'esclaverie parce qu'on y comptait 118 marchands d'esclaves portugais. Uh, and during the time of slavery, uh, there were many slave houses all around the island because the slave, uh, the merchants, the people are selling the slaves, there were about 118. Et la population libre était de 1200 âmes. And the free people here, there were about 1200. Gorée était le centre de transit le plus important de l'Ouest africain. And this island of Gorée was the most important transit center from all around West Africa. I want to know, 